I want to leave a foundation for our younger generations and even my kids in the future to say, oh, musical theater is amazing and kids won't be teased for being into theater or the arts, period. I want to be a Navy SEAL, so I need to learn how to talk to people. And if I don't, then I cannot be an effective leader. But then again, the leader's not supposed to be wrong a lot, so it goes back and forth. I want to be an actor. It's not fading, it's just becoming more realistic. And I know how many people were in the theater department at my school. I want to make an impact, and they've just went to an art school. Everyone does not have equal access to art, but people who do have good access to art it is always a good thing for them to pass it forward and give other people access to art. My daughter goes to a very small fine arts magnet school, regular Chicago public school. 39% of the kids are below the poverty line. Their budget is tiny, but these kids are amazing. If you expose them to it, they're amazing. So if we have money, why don't you put that money back into the schools y'all closed? Why don't you invest in the teachers so that I don't have to pay as much to support my daughter's public school as it is putting her in a private school? Now, we grew up, like, we took our theater classes, and we didn't have to have outside groups come in to our school to provide supplementary arts education. What was the scene about? Mm -hmm. Love Lady. Huh? What? Love Lady. What was the, the deeper meaning of the scene? The, 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 the Love Lady. The lady gave him advice, even though she didn't like him. So, Kyle, what was the lesson of the scene, though? I guess. Trust ugly people. Trust ugly people. Okay. Nice shot, guys. That's so Art is one of those things I don't think any other species other than human beings are experiencing on the same level. I've never ever felt financially stable by any means, and but I've also never felt like I couldn't do my work. I've always had at least one or two projects going all the time. Okay, good. So listen up. Good details. I like the gas heat. The details of the pie, you see what I'm saying, just agree to it, yeah. right? Whatever they say first, yeah. just agree to it. I've been teaching improv probably for 10 years now. I've been doing this for After School Matters for th three years. This is my third year. After School Matters is designed to compensate kids to take art classes, to, to take all different kinds of art classes, skateboarding, uh, skateboarding design. Um, I just saw a girl last night who teaches bricolage, which is kind of like graffiti. It's the only program in the country that pays, it's a paid art program for kids to, to, to get into this, this, these kind of things that they probably wouldn't have the opportunity to do otherwise. It gives you a reason to try it. Not that everyone needs a reason to try it, but it gives you that gentle push that helps you discover these, these different art forms. I said, don't never stop black girl We need a pencil. I got a pencil right here too. I have been telling kids if they're there just for the money, then they're wasting their time. They're going to be working. It's, it's going to be up on their feet and they're going to be improvising a lot. They're going to have to put effort into this. I think creating an opportunity for a kid to have a free after school program sounds right to me. Paying a kid to go to an after school program is sad. Giving a child a stipend so that they can express themselves through art rather than have to work at Burger King, I'd go for that. Wait, I think it's a great incentive to get people, to get the students involved and signed up, to give them a reward. You're going to get not only this great training, but you're also going to get this financial reward at the end. It's a band-aid, if you will, to solve a greater problem. It is incentivizing the teens, and hopefully it is luring them because it is a positive experience and it is a training that they're getting. It is something that they can put onto the resume, so I think that is great. Can it help kids in, in low-income neighborhoods, you better believe it. People need a way to express themselves and work together. When I first started, I thought that you had to have money to take classes like this, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing it at all. I think getting paid to do improv like kind of like pushes you, like, you know, like, oh, and you're like, I want to do this, it's fun, and I'm getting paid. It's weird getting money for this, like doing ASM. I did a painting one last summer and I was like, it's so weird getting paid to paint. Like it's weird getting paid to do improv. Some people do after school matters because of the money, but 
Like once they start, they actually like it because maybe they learn something from it. It wasn't the motivation for the improv. It was like uh, the motivation for my job this summer, but the improv, it was just friends here kept me going. I don't even see it as a job. I see it as a way to have fun and stuff, but it's also a way to get paid and have fun. And I think like I could be having the worst day ever, but as soon as I get here, I have my mindset say I'm going to have a good day, even though I was having a bad morning, it always works out. Well, my parents are glad that since I can't get a job, we still get paid. And like, I get paid for something I enjoy. I could help a little with the house. I don't want them going through it alone to feel like there is only them. I want to help too. I would do improv even if it didn't involve money at the end, because I, I like improv. I actually want to apply for classes at Second City when I get this money so I can build a resume because I know I have to. I kind of just have been like buying food, <laughs> putting money on my venture card, like nothing really big. I was going to get a phone, but I don't have enough now. My mom's birthday's coming up. I'm getting her something. I brought a laptop, so <laughs> I cannot really use that money, so I'm like, I got to pay back. So I'm, I guess I'm glad I'm paying back right now. I gave money to my mom to pay, to pay the phone bill. Gave her money to send to my grandma to Mexico. Um, my mom really doesn't let me spend my money like that, so it's still there in a bank account. I think people would still do the arts program if it wasn't paying because like it does give you something to do in the summer and like the schedule, like you can do other stuff while you're doing it. I know some people who had ASM and like they were doing something else, so. I think it's like more for fun. It starts with shit like after school matters programs. People need to know in every neighborhood in this city that they are heard. If you want every voice heard, you're gonna make this as accessible to as many people as possible. And that is through scholarships, which is paying someone to be in your program or paying for it. And sometimes like this class, like, like uh, Stephanie and John and Ruth, they've been with me for a long time. They're alphas and they're leaders and they'll, they'll come and they'll give their best effort. So that usually influences the class to bring their best every time. I'm excited about these new kids too. Um, actually, this is my first year of doing improv. I heard about After School Matters through a, a family member, my oldest cousin. He is also in After School Matters and um, I just wanted to try it, so I applied for it. I am in the theater department at Chicago Academy for the Arts. I'm here to expand my horizons on improv because we don't have it that often. I used to be super serious about acting. I only did Shakespeare and stuff like that. So this opened my range. It helps me do my monologues and stuff when I'm going to auditions. It helps me give me, uh, open my character up more. I'm just doing improv. One of my favorite things to do. I'm getting scared. I'm too high. I know you are. I told you to not. Ah! I wasn't going to help you. You got to get up yourself. I dislocated my leg. I don't know how to fix that. Improv comedy is acting without a script, and it's just listening and reacting to each other on stage. It's rooted in Chicago. It started with the Compass Players, and then Second City, and then evolved into more long form at the I.O., and continues to be a very strong um, part of Chicago comedy. It's like playing as kids but you're an adult with adult sensibilities. And if you're lucky, you get a piano player. Improv teaches you to survive and to work without, to create something out of nothing. And I think a lot of times that's stifled. That creativity to create, to build, to imagine, to discover, to explore something, to like all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, I can make this. Just to think in that way that we can create, 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 because that's what separates our species from everything else. I think that's the best skills that reminds us to think on our feet, to improvise and trust our instincts. For me, it is a sociological study of the human condition. So I get to try on people and see what's up with them and then leave them at the gate. And that's why I have a phrase, if you don't have fun, you're the asshole. I grew up watching SNL every weekend with my parents and my dad always got like Second City tickets from his work. It's, it's a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. I kind of have to think a little bit more than I usually do. I didn't really like having things to do in the summer and like I knew it had to do with acting and I just decided like oh let me try it you know. And I did um, do improv in school. We had like an improv club and I thought it was like interesting. I like improv better than acting script because um, with improv, it's your direct reactions. 
and that's more realistic than what you're told to do. I surprise myself because I don't know what I'm going to say and then when I say it, I'm like, wow, I didn't know I was thinking that. I like to do voices, like to play around with people like with different characters, maybe being like mean, sweet. That's the best part because you're not being rude to anybody or something like that. Yeah, I've been doing improv for three years now. People say I'm the responsible one. Like I'm the one who doesn't really play a lot when other people are playing. So I feel like improv gives me a chance to break out and be fun and like have fun. So, and like not take everything so seriously. I like that you can be yourself in improv. Yeah. Show your own personality. You don't have to change who you are or anything like that. I, at first, I didn't really like it. Kind of like judge myself more. I got better with like physicality, agreeing, and like not holding back as much. It's fun, but it's also nerve-wracking. Improv has helped me with self-confidence, but it's still there sometimes. And being on stage in front of people you don't do improv with every day, it gets uh, bothered. So I don't know. If that's I, I think it's something that will take time to get over, and it's a good thing to get over. It's kind of like the whole social anxiety aspect of performing, which is good for me. I need other ways to deal with anxiety issues other than medications. <laughs> My least favorite part of doing improv, I mean, I've learned to accept it now, but like when I want to do something and then like someone comes up with something else and you're just kind of like stuck on the spot and you have to immediately change it unless the show doesn't go on. And um, my favorite part is probably like the funny ideas and like having people like say stuff you wouldn't expect and things like that, yeah. Well, callbacks are really good in improv because they get the most laughs. Why I'm good at it, I don't know. <laughs> See this line? Yeah. This is my line, okay? You don't come near there. You don't even breathe over here. Don't go over here. Don't you smell over here, right? <laughs> So, okay. I want to divorce you, but I know if I divorce you, you're going to take my house away, so we're just going to split the house in half, all right? Sweet Johnny, um, we're married, and you, you don't you sleep in the same room, but you have a lot. I'm going to have the line in the bed, too, don't worry. Oh, gosh. Can and that scene like gets the most laughs. So once you have made a ground state relationship, as Jack says, you go back, and people do other scenes, and you come back at a funny time where you know it's dragging a little bit, you want to bring it back with that scene, and they're really hoping for it. They want to see it again. This chair has a line on it, okay? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So uh, don't come over here. That's my new baby. I'm my head now, so <laughs> you stay on that side. Yeah. Oh. Oh All right, now I got to draw a line in our kid, too. Come on, oh, son. Wait, wait. <laughs> I think I'm a better teacher than I am at this craft, like actually doing it. I look at it from a, more of an analytical perspective, and sometimes that doesn't work on stage. You can't really analyze it. You just have to kind of feel it. So I have to kind of put myself in that mindset when I'm performing versus when I'm teaching. Try to be specific with what you're talking about and with your object's work. So brushing your teeth, make sure you, if you're holding a toothbrush, there's space in between, you know? Yeah. Or if you're washing your hands, make sure that you, know, you grab the dish soap and your hands, turn it off, right? So make sure it's specific verbally and um, the object's work is very specific too. One thing that I love that Jack does, period, like with him, with himself, he asks you how's your day going, and then he do the circle, which helps a lot. So you, like you can tell others like you're having a bad day. You can tell he loves what he does, and he doesn't get frustrated with us. And I know that we're not experienced to that much improv, so the fact that he takes time and teaches us stuff and does get mad at us is great. Why is object work important? Yeah. Um, object work is, is important because like if you if someone says oh I'm um, cleaning a pig you just not gonna stand there like you want to actually grab it and actually work with it because you want it to seem real because you can't use objects and improv. Right. It has yeah. to be with it. What's that? You have to use your movement, your whole body. Yeah. To, to act. Yeah. You don't see actors just standing on the television. They're just standing right. up there and speaking. They're actually moving and doing something. Yeah. So. You want to make active choices on stage, right? We want to see movement on stage because it's exciting for an audience, right? So that, that exercise specifically is kind of to help people be doing something while you're thinking something else. Mm -hmm. It's like walking and chewing gum, right? I mean, I think these kids get worn out. I think, they're real, I think they get tired by the end, but so do I. I mean, I understand. I try to vary it up and give them time to 
sit and write down things, varied up with being on their feet as well. Usually I've pu pushed them hard enough so they understand that they have to bring emotion on stage at least. I, I, that's been my experience so far, that they, they become more expressive on stage and more open. Push it, Eric. Okay. How do you feel now? Mom, I'm getting mad at you. There you go. You push it. Right push it. Stop. Jerry, Mom. please don't. Please don't kill me. I'm your mother. Mom, let's, no. Let's get back to me. Get mad. Put the knife down. Put the knife down. Mom. Put the knife down. More, more. More, 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 more. Give me the phone. Jerry, put the more, knife down. More, 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 Jerry. Come on, Jerry. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Mom, open up. Stop. My favorite part is when we actually do scenes and my least favorite part is like uh it's like the the games that we play in the beginning because i just want to do the scene and if you smile then you go in the middle so you got to keep your face straight okay okay you gotta try it's so important during those first weeks when we're teaching improv is that we don't rush the trust and getting to know you exercises. Even the teachers that go out and teach now, it's like, wait a minute, you're going into scenes too quickly and they don't have the fundamentals. They don't know how to, how to respect each other yet. They don't trust each other. How can they communicate and be nice to each other when they're just reacting or just saying what's off the top of their head? They're not truly being in the moment. It's still fueled by ego. There's still all these eyes. And of course, you know that mantra we say, there's no I in team. To me, that's a true indicator that ensemble hasn't been created yet. So the director, the teacher, the healer, the doctor, because we play all of those things, has to gingerly take the time and give the space and figure out what those exact games and exercises are so that everyone is on that same even keel page where you're seeing this person as an extension of yourself. Okay. Honey, I love you. Can you please just smile? Smile! <laughs> 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 that was a laugh. That was a smile. That was a laugh. That was a laugh. You're going in. Yes. You got it. I do think teens have an even greater capacity because one, they're not in their adult self yet, so they're still in that formative development stage. Adults, you know, they're more ingrained and developed. So I think teens have a, you know, we have a bit more leverage with them. Okay, we need a suggestion. Zombie, Zombie. 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 First thing you hear, guys. Chinese, Chinese, people. Chinese people. Well, I mean, my first instinct is if the kid says, I gotta laugh, and then at what expense? You know, at what expense? At whose expense? What are we laughing at? I love Welcome it. Welcome to the Parkour Dragon. What would you like to order? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, special with kids, but, um, orange chicken that comes with egg or rice. We ran out of egg roll, and we also ran out of orange chicken. <laughs> We choose another order. We have the number one wall. Oh no, I actually we ran out of egg The laugh is very powerful, but on what part of the scale is it? I mean, minstrels got laughs, you know, but at the expense of people who are being ridiculed and oppressed. The people were laughing. Let me ask you a question. How do you guys feel in that in that montage? Is it okay to portray racism? But well, tell me what you think about it. I um, Chinese people are such is such a like eco set China or something. I don't know. I think there are just boundaries, and if you couldn't do it in front of them, then you shouldn't do it at all. Even though there was a joke and it's comedy, let's say a Chinese person was here, they wouldn't find it funny because they feel like they're making fun of them. Let's say the suggestion was African, right? And I'm African. And if they did something like they if, like they were doing with the Chinese people, I would find it offensive because I'm like, you're not African, you don't know our culture, so you can't be doing that to us. Just because you see stuff, that's not what it's supposed to be. The only thing I thought was bad about that suggestion was I knew that the, <laughs> the main stereotype gonna happen and it did but that's that's the only thing that I thought was bad about it when they do like black people they 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 do the, the stereotypes that we have or like a country accent or a Jewish person I don't know it's not as serious or whatever
well. I want the acrylic. Um, but I want the bedazzle on this finger. No. But you gotta make sure you do this nail a different color. Different color? What color do you want? I want blue. Blue? blue. <laughs> I want blue. At certain points, it is appropriate to talk about drugs and like violence and improper things. At a point, there isn't. You shouldn't. Racism, too, like, it kind of get people are kind of offensive over racism, but they don't really care that much about drugs and violence. But it shouldn't be, like, talked about because maybe you don't know what some another person has been through. Let's beat them up. They're racist, man. Yes, chop, chop. The thing about racism is that older generations have always passed it down, and our generation stopped it. I mean, yeah, we got some social issues, like, you know, the Facebook stuff, but racism. That's just wrong, we all know it together. We hang out with everybody. I know there's some judgmental people up there, oh, you're uh, uh, But racism was never a big problem in my childhood. Uh, there's some stereotypes <laughs> that should be out of the way. Like, I'm Mexican, right? I don't mind if I eat tacos, I'm Mexican. <laughs> yeah, <man. laughs> but if you say that I'm coming from a different country, I don't have my papers, so, like, that costs money, I think. Right, right, right. 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 Very valid your life, man. It's just reading your jokes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was horribly offensive, but I also thought it was really funny at the same time. I mean, I don't know, I liked how Jana actually brought aspects of the culture, like with the dragon at, at the New Year, I was like, okay, finally they're kind of breaking away from this. That's a nice dragon! Hey, y'all better be careful, it might breathe fire out of them. I don't know, I don't like that. I feel like it all depends on the audience. Like, when I do the old Jewish person, or like the, the white trash smoker mom, or whatever, like, I know some people who would be offended by it, like in my family, because that's how they actually are, and they'd be like, you just took that and used it as a character. But I also know a lot of people who would find it really funny. Yeah, everyone has their own stereotypes, and we find it funny sometimes when we cross the line. It's like, uh, so how do we find that line? How do we find that Once you know that the audience is not laughing or they're giving a stern look, because you should look at your audience, because you're only as funny as your audience to take laughs. I don't think everything can be joked about, because like certain people have been through things and certain things and if you joke about it, like they might feel some type of way. My parents are from Africa. And people always turn around and make jokes about my last name, African booty scratcher. That's what they used to call me in school or like you swing on Vine. One thing that kind of pisses me off is when they make like the clicking sounds like, like, no. When you play the And it's not, no problem with that. It's about how how you take it, and sometimes like we know we joke it, so I believe like it shouldn't be handled so heavily. So you think you can joke about anything? Do you think? Yeah, yeah. You think so? I mean, I'm still like trying to figure it out myself. You know, I've been doing improv for ten years. If you're gonna portray another race or another character, try to do it with integrity. Don't make it a stereotype. That's kind of what John was saying. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to the moment. <laughs> Where everyone is free. There is no God. But, you know, as we grow as human beings, you learn more about other races and about the world and about everything, and you can make more intelligent decisions as far as that goes. That's my opinion. So who is that big family? <laughs> <laughs> that is not the big family. Mm -hmm. He wants the mom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All based on the audience suggestion. And so, like, Michael gives me, um, let me see, Jewish character. I know nothing about the Jewish knowledge. Right. But, like, I will try my best to play that Jewish character. Like, I will throw up our misfo or something. <laughs> like, what Ruth was saying, like, if you have knowledge of that culture, I feel like it's okay to go a little further with it. Not necessarily, like, cross the line, but, like, if you know that culture, like, if you're surrounded by it, whatever, then it's, like, okay, whatever. Like, it's not as offensive. Like, they can do it to a point where it's 
funny and not offensive. The suggestion was like Chinese people, so you have to have boundaries because there are certain things you just shouldn't do because it's, it's wrong and it's racist, but every scene was not about like this. Or I mean, I don't really care. I just, it's real, like racism is really real, so why not at least be able to make fun of it? <laughs> I feel like we're making fun of racism and poking fun at that instead of at, at the different races and different stereotypes and people. Like more just like the fact that we have these like lines drawn or whatever between people. If we're gonna teach this world something as a sociological study for the human condition via improv comedy, you're gonna have to learn what comes out of your mouth and you're gonna have to own it. So if you're homophobic, then you're playing a homophobic character. Otherwise, you're a homophobe. And that is not okay. Not, in, not if you want this society to evolve. Being together, you know, it helps us form, like, it doesn't, doesn't really matter, like, what kind of race we are. Like, with Michael, we call him Cracker, but it's not, like, to be racist or anything. We just like to have fun. Like, we also make fun of our own race, you know. But we, we don't take it too seriously knowing that we've been together for a little while and we've got a chance to get close to feel about each other. I don't think it's okay to joke about stereotypes that you know cross the line, but you do it anyway. I don't think that's okay in any case, even in improv. But say if someone was doing something about my race, I don't get offended because sometimes it doesn't even apply to me. No one really talks about these topics in their day life. Like they just don't sit down at the table, oh, let's talk about sex and drugs and violence. So I think improv actually opens you up. So if they give you a suggestion, you can actually learn about it or hear about it and voice your ideas while also playing a character and entertaining people. Sometimes some things go too far and it should be stopped. But other than that, I believe improv is a great way to talk about these um, ideas. I feel comfortable doing like religion and violence and stuff like that because we know, like, you know, we're not doing it to hurt anybody. And like, I am a Christian, so I know it's okay. So, what this passage is telling us that since God created the world, whatever He created is good for us. Yes, you know what I mean? So like, if you wanna, you know, shoot somebody, it's you know, okay. It's okay, because that's what the Bible is telling us. I disagree. Kids should be bringing up drugs, you know, the bad things, because that is an everyday part of their experience in their life. And we know as improvisers, when we get into a class with adults and they're bringing up race, the stereotypes, gender, sexual orientation, all that, it's like, okay, they're going for the blue. Adults do that too. So if the teens are doing it, it's like everyone has to get that out of their system. There's, I can't even remember what game it is, but it is very beneficial. It's just like, okay, let's just go for the worst nightmare or movie that we can play and do, and we're just gonna make this a whole guts and glory scene. You don't wanna resist that. If he created the earth, the earth has cracked. He created one. I love, I love. But tell me why last Tuesday I saw that smoking. Yeah, I just, yeah, we saw you at that store. Yes, we, we saw you, okay? You know, we all thought we were at four. I had to say the little By smoking crack. crack. You want them to regurgitate all of that junk. And then it's like, okay, we've got that out of our system. Now we can start on a clean slate because we know there's so much more than, than drugs and then violence and killing each other than that. But we've done that now, right? Okay, so now we can start from somewhere else. Now we can do somewhere else. But you've got to, I think, give them permission to get that out. You should be attending to this lady. Um, Miss Luckett, can, are you, are, do you feel pain here for me? Ah! <laughs> are you, do you want to go to the waiting room and wait? No! Uh, I'm not waiting no longer. Get this thing out of me. What is wrong with you guys? I don't, think, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think if it's repressed, you know, and we don't let them have it out, it's just then, you know, we've got to, then I think that we're stifling them. So then you, you want them to show that and then pose a question to them to show the absurdity. Uh, Sandy, what did, what did you hear on the Bible? Um, no. Just regular shootings in Vegas. Every day, drugs. We should like twist that and like put clowns in there. <laughs> That's like, yeah. And so I think if you push and penetrate, you will then allow them to dig deeper once you let them 
get out all of that junk. It could be argued that this is the only place that you can do that, that you can take those risks. Maybe in the real world you can't take those risks, but maybe on stage you can take those risks. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's the whole idea behind censorship, right? So censoring art, like that's, a, that's the next level. That's, that's what we're arguing against, you know? That's that performer's choice. Should that be censored? Should someone be like, you can't do it that way? I mean, what is that, what, you know, what is the art form then? What happens to the art form at that, if it that's, dies. it dies, yeah, I, I agree. I think the most important thing is to be honest. I think if we're just being honest and truthful and we just tell the truth, then I don't think we have to worry about being PC. You know, if we are just telling the truth, we're all working on the same page because truth doesn't have any levels, but PC is like, okay, I gotta frame my question or my response in a certain way so that it fits or da da da, as opposed to truth just bypasses all of that. You know, so I think there might be a little bit of BS with with PC, you know, no pun intended, but <laughs> right. Here's the thing. I'm not interested in um, censoring someone, but at the same time, that means everything is protected by us walking into the space. This has got to be an examination of something, ultimately. I mean, that's why comedy is so great for the human condition. There's definitely two sides to that coin. But I think if you approach it with integrity and with empathy, too, and you try to understand where that culture, where that person's coming from, I think that's all you can really do. Because you can't, you can't be someone that you're not. You know, I, I wrestle with this stuff too, because I'm not sure about content. You know, because in my opinion, you guys should be able to say it whatever you want. I encourage you guys to explore things, explore your life. That's what this is all about. This is about being as honest as you can with yourself and with each other, through a character or without a character, right? And that's that's why I believe in this art form. Or that's why I believe in you guys. You know? Yeah. There you go. Everybody, everybody has been respectful to each other, you know. We have some arguments sometimes here and there, but, you know, we have respect for each other. I, I definitely respect everybody for their hard work and everything. And, yeah. So, religion and race, like, those are pretty heavy, heavy uh, montages. Let's go play kickball without fighting. I work with kids like uh, this age through all all different demographics. I think that they're always excited. They're way more excited. They're never going to be arguing with you either about what your comedy philosophy is, which I like because if it's funny, it's funny, right? Are you ready? I guess we ready. Yeah, you got your seatbelt on? Yeah, you got your seatbelt Because yeah, I'm not trying to kill nobody, you know, I never passed that driver's test. <laughs> yeah. um, Oprah Winfrey and Tyler Perry, they're my role models because, like, they basically came from nothing, but, like, they're two of the most powerful people in the world. And it kind of shows me that, like, even though I live in Chicago, even though, like, I'm not the richest, I can still get somewhere. And if they got somewhere, I can. Like Oprah Winfrey, her grandmother used to make um, dresses out of potato sacks for her, and she was like really poor. But like she's one of the most influential women in the world, and that's just like one of my role models because she's been through so much, and it's like kind of telling me like, oh, whatever you're going through, is you know like she made it, you can make it too. Why you got eggshells in your cookies? Well, you didn't tell me what to put in these <laughs> things. How so was I supposed to know? You said two eggs, so I put them in there. <laughs> <laughs> Did you put sand in the cookie? You did not tell me what to put in the <laughs> I thought that's what the brown came from. Like, brown sand. <laughs> Dakota Fanning. She was the reason why I started liking acting and watching movies and things, because seeing her being little in movies with Denzel Washington, I was like, oh, I want to do that too. So, Ellen DeGeneres, who's my idol, because she's real and she's very true. And she tells you that you need to be yourself and you need to be kind. And that's what I try to do. 
Being true to yourself means doing your own thing and not worrying about anybody else. If you feel like you're an outsider in the group, then you're doing it right. You're being true to yourself. You don't, it means you don't have to fit in. Like in school, I don't follow the in crowd. I couldn't do it if I wanted to because I'm just that different. Oh, well, yeah, and there ain't no way to jump in that certain way to jump. You gotta be civilized, girl. We ain't in the hood. Yes, we is. What you mean? Look where we at. But we in the upper class of the hood. Chirac is still the hood. My brothers are mainly motivating me. They motivate me to like do better and try my hardest to achieve and like do the right thing. They're my role models. My family supports me a lot. My sister is very supportive of me. Ever since my mom passed away back in September, she has been like my rock. So I love my sister to death. And like she pushes me to say, always like, if even if you're not 100% sure, just try it and do it. Especially with programs and stuff, she's like someone I look up to. I think that it's extremely important to expose kids to stuff very early, everything. College, travel, and I'm thankful that Jonathan and I are so far apart because he, he was able to see all of that. He's able to actually see me graduate and see me work on papers and actually see me now still working on presentations and, and grading and talking to students. I'm proud of him. He's grown into such a fine young man. He really is. Yeah, he really has. And he obviously gets his fashion sense from you guys. You know what <laughs> Well, I can't take all the credit. He was so natural. Yeah, it was like he, it was all mm -hmm. second nature to him. You know, like mm -hmm. he was just out there having fun. I guess that's exactly. the way it should be, you know. But I'm like, man, you might have a little talent, man. Mm -hmm. you, you know, a little fine tuning here, a little fine tuning there. You might be able to do a little something. I, I have dyslexia. When it comes to school, well, I get good grades and stuff, but sometimes I get confused. I get my S confused with my T when it comes to spelling and stuff. And when it comes to math, I'm really not that good with numbers. My role model is Stevie Wonder because he's blind and he doesn't really let that affect him. And I feel like people with disabilities are my role models. They want me to be a doctor. That's like basically every African parent's dream. Like, oh, you know, I came here from Africa. You should be a doctor and then, like, take care of me. And they see actresses and stuff like that, they're like, oh. But, like, if I got a degree, I think they'd be okay with it, hopefully. I don't know. I want to continue some sort of improv. I mean, I have, like, a plan for, like, real life, what I'm doing with school and all that. But I definitely want to have that, like, outlet because I'm planning on going into the medical field, getting a certificate in nursing. It's sad. You see people dying every day. You see you have to, like deal with issues that suck if you don't have like some sense of humor and some like outlet like like doing improv that would be a good thing to do if you're working in a stressful area like that like just for fun on the side every night like in my room like I like have like a perfume bottle and I just like hold it and then I imagine like I'm in the audience and they have the camera to my face and I'm like oh my gosh and then like I have to cry first because you know if you don't cry you know I have to cry I'm like, oh my gosh, I like to thank God, my family, you know, everybody. And then like, you like, they put cameras to the faces and then you see Oprah Winfrey like, like sitting there clapping and stuff and like all these people who are like important. And you know, like I dream, that's my dream, you know. The speech I have planned out is like, first I thank God, then my family, then I say like any kid who's like, you know, wants to like do the same thing, it's possible for you, you know. And I'm like, peace, and like, I hold up the like, Oscar, and then I walk out. I just hope I don't fall. Ah, you broke my leg, oh my god! And I'm gonna do it again if you keep <laughs> seeing my man. I told you, leave him alone. He don't want you, he only wants me. If he don't want me, why he always at my house? I don't know! I see myself um, attending college and like having like a minor in theater or something, because I know my mom would kill me if that was my major. And after I graduate, then going to like acting classes and maybe auditioning for stuff. Make you look call crazy. 911? So they could arrest me? Um. <laughs> See. Did she react to the attendant? Yeah. Yeah, she absolutely did. Nice physicality, way to fall in the crowd. Perfect. That's exactly what she my favorite quote, and, it's, and I don't know who said it, is tragedy plus time equals comedy. Um, I had that posted on my tack board when I was going through a personal experience that how am I going to get out of this circumstance? How am I going to get out of this adversity? 
And I just kept saying, well, tragedy plus time equals comedy. One day I'm going to be able to laugh at this situation. It's hard. It's challenging right now. But there's going to be some humor in this. And I'm going to make it through. So seeing that every day was my mantra that kind of helped me survive out of a crazy time. Hey. Oh. Hey. You broke my leg. You broke my leg. Ready? One, two, three. You broke my leg! Why'd you do that? The show! I'm gonna death. But I can't let that happen. <laughs>
and just knowing that nobody really cares, just be yourself, be confident, don't worry about it if you mess up, keep going. Tonight we have John Cena versus Randy Orton in a tables, <laughs> ladders, and chairs match. Please don't try to break the table that much because we're low on funding money. That's the whole okay. I do not promote he violence. Me, and I'll you don't promote violence if you allow us to do this? We should do this with him. Nah! <laughs> <laughs> I've been more aggressive lately. Usually I just think things in my mind like, oh, this person's an idiot. And then I was just like, you're an idiot. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Fat Alley. I'm really depressed. Today I broke a table. <laughs> I thought it could support my weight. Do you think I could sit on that? Yeah. <laughs> Hold on, you know, I got a lot. <laughs> down. Down, down, down. Uh -oh. oh. <laughs> I think I broke that one too. <laughs> I'm a very self-conscious person. I used to be really, really shy, like you wouldn't believe it. But when I perform on stage, I'm comfortable now. Hi, my name is Cherisha, and I'm on the table. Here's some water. Hi, my name is Generisha. <laughs> <laughs> would you mind if I say you? No, no. Jonathan really enjoys acting, he enjoys improv, it gives him some positive outlets. He's always been a good kid, but this just helps him focus more. So this is something to do, it's his focus, it's his focus point. Yeah, we want to keep it really open all up in here for your sister's memorial. <laughs> well, I haven't been nervous at all since this isn't my first time, but I guess I just don't think about it as much. Okay, I got to run my strength race so we can fit them in your pocket. Good. I was hoping you were over there. Um, I, I want to steal tables. We're, we're valuable. We're too young. I don't know who's hoping to come. I am 11. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, grab that table. Drag it out. Police! <laughs> no, no! <laughs> hey, what happened? What's going on here? What's going on? What are you? Don't tell me you had that street break 5,000. Don't tell me you do. Uh, you were on probation. <laughs> street break. You are not allowed to use a shrink ray. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's my shrink ray. <laughs> In the past months, we've grown together like a family, you know? I won't miss some of them. <laughs> That's my eyeballs! <laughs> That was fantastic. Did you guys feel great about that? Yeah. yeah. It was flawless. Amazing. Wow. Really? Yeah. Seriously. It was so good. I used to be a shy person and didn't really talk much until I got to know you and it took me a while to get to know people. But no, I built my confidence. Like, I get along with everyone pretty well. Describing myself, I was actually like rude and all that because I hang out with my friends too much. Like, they gave me like too many bad choices, but Starting improv, I met new people. I enjoy stuff more, and the best part, I keep myself out of the streets and trouble. Improv made me a very ugly person. Hey, what's your name? I don't know you, but hi. <laughs> you look cool. I guess I have more confidence. Before, I'd be like, oh, I don't want to do that. Maybe I might look stupid, but then like, you know, everyone like promotes you. They're like, oh yeah, you should do it. That's funny and stuff like that. Yesterday, I was thinking about becoming a president because at, at our school, we have this national honor society. And at first, I didn't want to be president, but now I really want to become the president of the thing. So I think improv has definitely helped me with my confidence and being able to speak in front of people and stuff. I'm so proud of this group. Let's say it one more time. Jack, One, two, three. Jack,